Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to our event today. Um, we're thrilled that George Don is back in Portland um, to speak about his new book, Lexington and Concord, The Battle Heard Around the World. And Jim Nelson is here to um, do a conversation with him. Hillary Link is here from the Maine Historical Society, who we're co-presenting this with. She'll do a bit of an introduction for Jim, and Jim will introduce George. Um, and thanks for being here. All right, so um, I'm happy to introduce Jim Nelson, who's a former professional sailor aboard the tall ships for the past 24 years, though. He's been a full-time author of more than 20 works of fiction and nonfiction, including two award-winning books about the Civil War and the American Revolution. And he's joining us today from his home in Harpswell, um, and he'll uh, be happy to introduce George here, and we'll get started. Excellent, thank you. Can you folks hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Um, George and I are not used to sitting up this high without a bar in front of us, so if it uh, <laughs> might throw us off a little. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, it is, it's, a, it's a delight to be here. It's a delight to be doing uh, this talk with George. Uh, we've done this a couple of other times over the years. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing George for a number of years, and he's, he's the kind of author that I most admire. He's an excellent writer, an excellent historian, but someone who really wears his scholarship very lightly. You know, if you met George, you would be more likely to think that he was the shop steward of your local pipe fitters union than a Harvard trained historian as he is. And actually, I just found out that his father and grandfather were labor organizers, which makes perfect sense to me now. Uh, George is a native of Boston, which will become evident the moment he opens his mouth. Um, he's a uh, <laughs> Uh, he's the winner of two Samuel Elliott Morrison Awards, which is impressive. I've only won one, so you got 50% more Samuel Elliott Morrison Awards than me, uh, <laughs> which is uh, very appropriate for, uh, for a historian from Harvard. Um, he used to live in Portland, but for some unknown reason has moved to New Hampshire. Um, but uh, anyway, so this is a lot of, uh, this is a great honor for me to be able to do this. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun. Uh, what we're gonna do, um, uh, I've got a, a, a few questions I'm going to ask George about his new book, Lexington and Concord, which if you did not notice is for sale at the back of the room, and the author will be there to sign it after the event. I might have some books there to sign too, if you are so inclined. Um, so I'm going to ask George uh, a few questions concerning the book and sort of get a discussion going, and we're going to leave time at the end uh, to do questions and answers. So if you have questions, and I hope you do, please uh, save them and uh, George will make something up, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, so with, with no further ado, um, when, when we're writing history, uh, one of the problems we run into is that we're basically taking a slice out of a continuum of time. You know, it's, it's always very difficult to to just sort of examine this one part of history specifically because it's so interconnected. I think one of the things you do so well in this book is uh, to bring in the French and Indian War, which of course was you know, crucial to what happened in the American Revolution. Um, but obviously at some point you have to decide this is where the book is going to start. So can you talk a little bit about how you got this time frame together? Uh, well, uh, let me say first, um that uh, it, it's a great honor for me and really a privilege to uh, have this conversation with uh, Jim Nelson, who was one of this country's really great writers, uh, not, only of, not only of fiction, but also of history. Uh, he has written uh, four classics uh, in history, nonfiction, uh, on the American Revolution that no historian writing uh, about uh, the American Revolution uh, uh, can, can ignore. Uh, each, one is, each one is a classic, so it's a great honor for me to uh, share this stage with him and to uh, respond to his uh, questions. Um, on why I, I uh, focus on Lexington and Concord, I did because it marks a turning point in world history. It's a great it's a great uh, divide before and after uh, Lexington and Concord. Uh, and the, the, the divide was between uh, a couple of, uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, 
Number one, uh, before Lexington and Concord, uh, nobody thought that America had a chance in defying uh, the British Empire. Uh, and after Lexington and Concord, that all changed. And the American Revolution, which changed the world eventually, uh, started here because it gave heart uh, to all the other colonies. Of course, it gave heart to the people of Massachusetts that they won this uh, battle. Nobody thought that they could. Uh, it gave heart to all the other colonies in New England, and it gave heart to the whole country. Uh, this diverse group of 13 colonies, which were so different, but were being, uh, but were being crushed by the British Empire in certain ways, uh, they came together. And they came together at this point because of this victory. Had there been no victory at Lexington and Concord, uh, had the British prevailed here, the American Revolution, in my opinion, never would have happened, or would have happened much differently in, in a, a uh, much different way. And uh, what the Americans were showing here, another, another divide, a historical divide, what the Americans were showing here uh, was that uh, the British Empire was, was not going to become uh, the great empire that the British king and the British nobles who ran the kingdom thought it would be. They thought that after the French and Indian War, uh, after they defeated all the other great powers, and particularly the French, they controlled North America, they controlled uh, most of the, uh, of the Caribbean, and they were going to become uh, a sort of an endless global empire with no end, the, the North America would stretch from the Atlantic to the uh, to the Pacific. They would be the greatest empire in the uh, in the history of the 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 world. Uh, and um, the Americans here were showing them uh, that they could not. Why why were the Americans standing up to them? After all, there are not an awful lot of good things about the British uh, that we still. Uh, uh, used today, uh, what the Americans didn't want was for Britain's, Britain's feudal hangover, I call it a feudal hangover, to be imposed here on, on them and, and the rest of North America as, as, uh, as we expanded. The feudal hangover was uh, very visible in England, even more visible in, in Ireland. In England, maybe about 500 uh, uh, aristocrats controlled the country, controlled the, the, uh, the political system, uh, controlled the, literally uh, the land. Uh, uh, they, uh, and, uh, they were, were extremely wealthy, uh, and the people who, who they ruled over were in fact serfs, and, and particularly in, in Ireland. And I open this book with uh, uh, two or three quotations from Benjamin Franklin when he took a tour of the British Isles uh, in uh, 1772, uh, and he reported back uh, to uh, his uh, American sponsors that uh, he couldn't believe the poverty uh, in Ireland. Here's England, the most uh, advanced country economically, and the people in Ireland were living like, like uh, uh, he, he couldn't imagine people live, like animals. Uh, and he said, you know, uh, the Indians in America live a heck of a lot better uh, than, these, uh, than these people do. When he, this was not just in Ireland, but it was also in Scotland and in, in, in large parts of, of England. And he contrasted this with what he saw in America. Well, in America, in Massachusetts, uh, uh, people, people were, by contrast, uh, very wealthy. The average person in, in Massachusetts uh, was, by, by English standards, very wealthy. They were also educated. There was no universal education uh, in, uh, in England. 
Uh, there were no aristocrats in, in Massachusetts who controlled all the land. Uh, there was voting in Massachusetts. The people who owned the farms, Massachusetts was a patchwork quilt of farms that, that people owned. Ownership was widespread. Uh, and these people not only were economically well off, but politically they ran their towns. They were represented in, um, uh, in, the, in the state legislature. Uh, were they represented the same type of people in, in London? No, nobody would even think uh, of that. So this was a, a, a great divide uh, in, in world history as the Americans were showing the world that, that the, uh, there, was a, a, there could be a different way of organizing economically and, and politically. And by the way, the people in America were very wealthy. They had done very well without the uh, aristocrats to uh, show them how to, uh, uh, how to live. So uh, I guess I talked too much. <laughs> no, no, that was, that was uh, excellent. But, but, you, but uh, this is the great divide. Uh, and I could go on for the next two or three weeks if you want to. <laughs> no doubt. No, just the next 45 minutes will be fine. <laughs> um, but no, that's, you make a great point, and, and that was a real eye-opener for me reading this book, because of course, one of the things that I'd always wondered about um, were some of the underlying causes of the American Revolution. I mean, we all know about taxation and representation and all that, but the Americans didn't have that much to complain about. I mean, we really, like you say, were very wealthy, very prosperous, much better living standard even than people in England. So the point that you make about the fact that there were examples of how this could be taken from them, I thought it was, was very potent. Well, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, they they uh, couldn't understand to begin with what the hell the king was up to. Uh, why was he making a fuss about them? They were, they were very successful. He ought to be overjoyed uh, with them. This is what he was upset about. He, he thought that, that it was his duty to, to preserve the British Empire and to expand uh, the British Empire. And he thought that, that if he didn't gain full control of the Americans, that they would expand west and, and precisely because they were so successful, uh, they, would get, they, would get, they would get very powerful and inevitably declare independence. They were not gonna allow a little island off the coast of Europe to uh, rule over this potentially great, uh, great continent. I, I would argue that King George is right about that, and he sort of pushed them into it quicker than they might have inevitably done it. E exactly, he, he, he was pushing. And the Americans on their side were saying, hey, we don't want to fight a war. Uh, why, not have, why not have a partnership? He didn't want a partnership. He wanted to take uh, the, 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 the semi-feudalism that was left over in England and impose that on every single colony and make serfs out of, the, out of the farmers, out of the prosperous farmers, take away their political and economic power. Well, that was a no sale here, okay? Uh, if you wanted to, <laughs> if, and even, even if you wanted to in some way uh, conquer them militarily, offering them uh, to take away their political power and their, and their economic well-being, that's, <laughs> uh, that's not much of a program. You're gonna, you're gonna have them fighting you. Keep this in mind. Uh, the, 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 the militiamen in Massachusetts uh, were led by, led by veterans, combat veterans of the French and Indian War. Uh, and so uh, the American army, militia army, that met the British uh, on, on, their, on their way back from Concord uh, was, was a much more professional outfit than even the British were because the British troops, there were only 700 of them that went out from Boston to, uh, to Concord via, via Lexington, uh, they had never been in combat. These, they, were, they were kids in, in uniforms and they looked terrific on the parade ground, but uh, that was it. Uh, and um, so uh, you, were not gonna, you, you were not going to uh, run roughshod uh, over the Americans. And then there were, there were all the great European powers 
okay, who had just been defeated by the British in the Seven Years' War, was known as the French and Indian War, war here. They were waiting for the British to be, to be crucified. The French couldn't wait to get in, into this. This is another story about France. It's, uh, 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 getting involved. In, oh yeah, in, in, well, it's, it's one of the great ironies is that France helps the uh, America win its independence and then the French peasants go, gee, you know, that sounds like a good idea. Maybe we should do that. <laughs> but let me, uh, yeah, let me uh, get back to the point that you just made. I mean, there's so many great stuff, things to talk about, but um, you made the point about the, f uh, the fact that the farmers were not just farmers like a lot of the British thought, but were French and Indian War veterans. Um, you're pretty hard on Thomas Gage, who is the, uh, if you want to explain who he is, but um, uh, do I tell? Why you uh, well, if, well, if you think I was uh, <laughs> hard on Thomas Gage, you should see his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. 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 Gage. Well, she was an American. Mrs. So. Gage was an American. <laughs> Uh, and a New Yorker, I believe. And, and uh, no, she came from New Jersey, of oh. course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, what can you? <laughs> so Thomas Gage is is the poor general in Boston, who was told by the king, uh, "You teach the Americans a lesson in Massachusetts that will reverberate throughout the colonies, and I won't have any trouble anymore. I will have my way with them." Uh, this was his, this was his, the, his, the orders. And the king gave him like 3,500 troops. Whenever I mention uh, numbers of troops, take it with a grain of salt, nobody knows the exact numbers, of, but that's roughly what it was. Uh, and facing Gage out in the countryside, uh, when, when the time came, 30 towns sent militiamen to do battle, okay? thousands and thousands, uh, way, way more than, than Gage had. Gage sent 700 troops out from, uh, uh, from Boston to, uh, to Concord to teach the rebels a lesson and, and to get rid of uh, an arms catch in, uh, uh, in Concord. He knew, he was an experienced general, he was a good officer, he had been in combat uh, here in America and other other places, he knew that that the countryside couldn't be couldn't be subdued or even influenced this way. And he kept writing letters back back to the king, saying, "You you know, if you want this done, you've got to give me a whole lot more more troops." And the number he mentioned was twenty thousand. Uh, and later on, as the war went by, it showed that even twenty thousand wasn't adequate. And in fact, there wouldn't have been any uh, adequate number. The king thought Gage was a coward. Here's one, a decorated officer who was no, no coward, risked his life uh, all the time. And so the king sent off his replacement. He sent off three generals, and one of them was named William Howe, uh, and he was going to replace Gage if Gage didn't get, get going and teach the Americans a lesson. So here's Gage in Boston. He has the king's orders. He knows that his replacement uh, is coming. So what he should have done was resign. And when General, General Howe showed up, he would have said to him, congratulations, General Howe. Uh, you got it. It's your, it's, it's your baby. Uh, and he could have easily done this by getting a sore foot or get the gout. Bone spurs. Or, 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 or not get a haircut or whatever. Uh, and Howe would have been, been delighted, and Howe had with him a, a couple of other uh, generals who were just dying to get involved over here, and, and Gage could have gone back to uh, England and live, live happily ever after with Mrs. Gage. <laughs> he didn't do that. Uh, he stayed there, and he sent the 700 troops out to uh, uh, conquered and it was a total disaster for him. The thousands of these well-trained militiamen showed up. They drove him back to Boston. Gage had sent out a uh, reinforcement of a thousand, so there was 1,700. It was nothing. The, the head of the uh, column became a guy named Percy, who was a great general, but the odds were, in, were against him were incredible. So 
the, these British troops were pushed back to Boston, and all of a sudden, Gage realized that the, this American, these Americans, all these Americans could come into the city. And the city was also full of rebels, don't forget. And they were armed in, in the city. So Gage was in fear of, being, of losing his whole army in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Boston. And uh, that's, that's an interesting part of the story, too, because the uh, Americans uh, weren't thinking that. There are reasons why that didn't happen. But he was very lucky, Gage, that that didn't happen. Well, like I said, I've always been particularly sympathetic with Gage. And one of the, the things about him is that he, he had come over as an officer to fight in the French and Indian War and was in America for 18 years. He became uh, governor, I think, of New York or... or he wasn't governor, no. he, was, he was head of the British Army. That's right, yeah. America, he was, that's yeah. right. He was the commander in chief and then he became uh, governor of Massachusetts and commander in chief. So I think Gage, it's, it's fair to say, knew Americans certainly better than any of these yahoos back in London. Absolutely. And I think he, he knew that this was going to happen. Lexington Concord was not a, a surprise to him. I think at one point, because he, he had fought with Americans in the French and Indian War, and he knew particularly this guerrilla style warfare was something that Americans excelled at. Yeah, and in, in fact, he, he had, had a hand in, in changing uh, some uh, military tactics in order to cope with the situation here. So yeah, he was a, he was a good uh, officer in an impossible situation. The only thing, the only puzzle that I have is why the hell he stayed there. Yeah, yeah. In the, in that situation, he should have resigned. You know, just like in Vietnam, instead of instead of the generals reporting back everything is fine, they should have resigned. Well, it's, it's funny how the history. Damn well, it wasn't fine. The history, uh, you know, repeating itself. I remember during the run up to the Iraq War, uh, one of the generals went before Congress and said, well, if we're going to fight Iraq, we need about 350,000 men. And, you know, uh, the Bush administration went nuts. Are you crazy? And it's, it's, it's exactly what George's administration did when, when Gage told him he needed 20,000 men. You know, so. 20,000 men. After they left Boston, okay, the British, um, they, they invaded America through New York. They, they, and the army, the army was... Uh, not much more than 20,000. Uh, it was actually, and again, it, these figures, you don't really know exactly what the figures are. But the, the, their army then grew to between 30 and 40,000. That wasn't nearly enough, you know? I mean, because look at the plan that the king had for them. We're gonna take away your political power and your economic power, and we're gonna make you serfs like you see in Ireland. <laughs> it's like he, you mean to say that the Americans didn't know what was going on in Ireland? What, how these people uh, lived? Just think of this, we were a great, we were a great trading country. You know this uh, uh, better than I do. We had, think of all the great seaports in the United States. The British merchant fleet at that time was over 3,000 merchant vessels. It was the greatest trading power in the world. You know where most of these ships were, were now being built? They were now being built in our, our, our yards, in, in American yards. Our seaports were thriving. There was a great interchange between the countryside and the seaports. The farmers were selling their, their uh, goods uh, over, overseas and the Caribbean and so on. And they knew what was going on in the world. They were educated uh, uh, people. Uh, they were very familiar with conditions in Ireland. They were not going to uh, put up with that. They were gonna. They were gonna fight. They didn't want their kids to to become uh, serfs. Yeah. You know, you do the same thing. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the things that I love about this book, you know, we tend to think in America of Lexington and Concord as being this intense battle that takes place outside of Boston, um, and uh, you do such a good job of looking not just at that fight, but at the larger context, and really the majority of the book is looking at the political situation that, that ultimately ended up exploding at Lexington and Concord. And could you talk a little bit about what was going on in England and, and sort of why you chose to write about that? Uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time in, uh, in England, and one of the things that I noticed early on was that the English writers don't know much about American history. Uh, and uh, 
that's, that's not by chance, and I don't know why, and that still continues on. So when, when they write about things like, like what we're talking about now, strangely enough, there's quite a bit about what goes on in England, but almost nothing or very little and very uninformed about what's going on here. So they're not, the two of them aren't uh, joined together, and, and f some of the writing here suffers from the same thing in, in reverse. Uh, the American writers don't include enough of, uh, of, of the Eng English, uh, what was going on. That, sure. But there was an argument going on in, in England in political circles. Not, not all of the aristocracy thought it was a brilliant idea what the king, uh, what the king was doing. And the leading figure in this was a guy named William Pitt, who had been the leader of the, of the British in the Seven Years' War, who was responsible for winning uh, the Seven Years' War, who was very popular in the United States and worked very well uh, uh, with the uh, Americans. And William Pitt, although he was, he was advancing in age and was, was not very well, uh, he, he publicly spoke uh, in Parliament about, about how stupid British policy was. He said, he said, look, the Americans don't want a war. What they want is a partnership. They want to get along with us. They love us. They love our language. They, they, look at how they talk. Look at the way they, they dress. Look, look at who, when they get rich, where they send their kids to school. They send them to London and Scotland and, uh, and so on. All you have to do, instead of fighting with them, all you have to do is, is have a conference with their Congress. All of, the, all of the colonies are represented in this Congress by their best uh, best men, they're dying to get along with you, they love you, why are you fighting them? It's, it's, it's foolish. And besides which, you can't fight them. You are never going to win this war. Just think of it. You're 3,000 miles away, there are all these people there, there are, and they're spread out over, over a, big, uh, a big territory. Uh, they know how to fight. And you would have to do what to keep them under control? You want to take away their, their political power, their economic power. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to station permanently British troops uh, there. It's going to cost you for, for what? When, when you don't have to. And, and if, you just, if you just have a partnership with them, they will eventually control that whole continent uh, from, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and, and uh, the British Empire will be the greatest in world history. You know who had that vision too? Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin said the same thing. He tried to tell the British the same thing. I tried and tried and tried, and all during the year before Lexington had conquered. He would publish, he was, he was in England, he didn't come back here until 1775, but uh, he would publish uh, in, 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 in British newspapers, uh, just what I'm saying. Why are you doing this? Uh, uh, you, you expect these guys who fought so hard in the French and Indian War just roll over? They're not going to, and they don't want to. They love you. Uh, so, uh, so there's every basis for, for an agreement here. What, what did the King and company want to do? They wanted to arrest Franklin and kill him uh, by, by talking some sense. He loved the empire all these years, he couldn't believe what was going on. And, and guess who, who he was very close with? Pitt. Uh, and if Pitt had been the king, or even the prime minister, uh, uh, it would have been a, 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 a much different story. So uh, I wanted to put, this, put the English side of it in just to show how stupid this work was. <laughs> Uh, and, and how unnecessary it was. And you know how many people got killed, uh, how many people suffered for all those years for nothing. And never mentioned in this is that uh, in the fighting that went on, the British captured a lot of Americans. Uh, probably uh, 30,000 were, were uh, 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 killed in one way or another in the war. 18,000 of them were prisoners. Not, obviously, the prisoners weren't killed at that point. But when British captured the prisoners, it's like all the venom, for some reason, 
all the venom and that some uh, that the that that the king and so on felt the, about the Americans got concentrated on these on these prisoners, and um, how would they treat them? Well, if you could capture the first thing they would do is starve you to death. They starved to death eighteen thousand of them. When you starve someone to death, they die. So it happens to you. Yeah. Yeah, that's and you get diseases along the way from, from malnutrition. So they can say you died for something else. You don't die of starvation. The British government used to supply food for the prisoners. The guys who were in the prisons took the food and sold it, stuck the money in their, in their pocket. The lead, the lead guy was a guy named Joshua Loring from Boston. Well, of course. What do you say? <laughs> uh, his wife was beautiful, and General Howe liked her. General Howe and Mrs. Loring were an item. And Joshua got paid off uh, with, this, with this job. Um, it was a, a lovely scene. <laughs> uh, and and eight, 18,000 dead. This figure comes from uh, uh, only recently because we've been so close to the British in the, in the 20th century. We've worked so close uh, with them that no one wanted to bring up this sore, sore subject. But it was the greatest war crime uh, of the 18th century, what they did to American prisoners. Did we do the same to them? No. No. We didn't treat them. Uh, sometimes we, did, we, we treated them poorly, but never like, ne nothing like this. Yeah. You, you talk about uh, Benjamin Franklin, of course, is a uh, just such a great character, and, uh, and you make the, the point that I think a lot of Americans certainly don't realize that Franklin was a very latecomer to the idea of independence. He, he struggled mightily to keep the British Empire together. And, and that, you know, when he, he goes to France ultimately as an ambassador, and the French view him as this sort of backwoods philosopher, this sort of quaint you know, fellow with the unpowdered hair, and, and, they, and they just love it. Of course, Franklin was nothing of the sort. He was a very sophisticated, you know, uh, well-known, internationally famous scientist and uh, philosopher, but he played it to the hill. I, I love Franklin. Um, and of course, one of the things that makes the book so, so wonderful are these characters that you flush out so beautifully, and of course, there were so many just wonderful characters uh, at that period. Could you talk about any of the others that you particularly liked or um, appealed to you? Sam Adams? Um. The, uh, the Adamses, uh, uh, Sam Adams uh, was um, 13 years older than um, John Adams. Uh, and um, John Adams was a, was a cousin. And, and uh, 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 the uh, the, the uh, writers who have written about uh, the, uh, the revolution have a lot to say about Sam Adams in the beginning. Uh, and uh, I remember when I first started out on this years ago, uh, I said to myself, what the hell happened to Sam Adams? <laughs> right. uh, we hear so much about him in the, in the 1760s, and the 1770s up until 1775 and 1776, we hear about him, and then he's gone. Did he die? No, he lived a, a, a quite a long time. Uh, well, why don't we hear about him more? Because uh, he destroyed his papers, if you can believe it. He, he gloried uh, in, in, it made no secret of the fact that he got rid of a lot of his papers. To me, if someone like that, a major f historical figure, and he knew he was a major historical figure, gets rid of his papers, he's hiding something. He wants his future <laughs> historians to, to ignore certain things that uh, he would like them to ignore and, and keep other. When I was a, a student uh, doing my PhD thesis, uh, one of the guys I had to look at was Henry Cabot Lodge, the old senator. And his papers were at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And before he became a senator, he was an historian at Harvard, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> and, and, and so I had to get permission from his, his uh, son, George Lodge, to look at the, uh, look at the uh, uh, papers. And when I was going through them, I could see that he had culled the papers. 
you know, I mean, just for for um, guys like guys like me. And uh, <laughs> so I assumed later when I got into Sam Adams that he was doing he was doing the same uh, same thing. Uh, he was a enormously uh, 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 talented uh, guy uh, who who uh, spent all of his time politicking. Uh, he literally spent spent every waking moment. Uh, uh, he would go to bed at midnight, and he'd get up early. And he was very puritanical. Uh, and he looked. He dressed and looked like a bum. Uh, he was. He 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 thought it was somehow sinful to uh, uh, to make money. Uh, he if he if he wasn't a, a, a fomenting a revolution, he he would have made a great monk. <laughs> right. Uh, well, he certainly seemed to be allergic to making money because he was a failure at everything he did except rabble rousing. Yeah, he was. He was a failure at all, any kind of. Uh, 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 economic enterprise he was in and proud of it. Oh. Uh, and so um, he was, he, uh, I'm, my next book is going to be on, uh, he's going to be in, in the next book and I'm wrestling with him, uh, with him now uh, and uh, trying to piece together his relationship with Washington, which, which happened very early. Oddly enough, Sam Adams, when the revolution started, after, after Lexington and Concord, uh, he became very interested in the military side of, of what was going on and, and became very close uh, to Washington. And Washington became close with him uh, as well because he wanted to keep an eye on him because he, he thought that Sam Adams would become a powerhouse in the Continental Congress just like he was in the Massachusetts uh, house in, in politics here, and Washington was a great political infighter. The reason Washington stayed where he was all those years was because he knew how to handle uh, these these politicians, and they they were how he handled Adams is classic. And I'm I'm writing a wonderful, if you pardon, you know. Sure, you are. I have no doubt you are. Story, story about that uh, that relation. I love it. Now I'm, I'm very intrigued now. But uh, John, can you tell us John, more about John Adams, John Adams uh, was the the 13 years younger uh, and extremely uh, ambitious. Uh, and Sam Adams really spoke. He was, did everything behind the scenes. John Adams couldn't stop talking. <laughs> John Adams was just the ex exact opposite and the both of them went off to to the Continental Congress first Congress second Congress second Congress was right after Lexington and Concord and here's John Adams he's out front he was participated in every major event he was a big factor in in the Declaration of Independence and so was Sam Adams but he was he was keeping very very quiet and at some point John Adams thought that Sam Adams was a little irritated with his with his being out front uh, so much, but the two of them were very much interested in in the war side of of uh, of the uh, of the revolution. And Adams, John Adams, even mentions that Sam Adams they couldn't have been closer. The Adams brothers, when people think about them, but John Adams says he's actually jealous of me. I think. Uh -huh. Says this, okay, uh, yeah. and I think he, I think, uh, uh, I, I think John Adams was, was uh, probably wrong, but Sam Adams certainly would, would want, wanted to shape the war policy, and particularly naval policy, if you can believe it. He didn't know a, know a <laughs> rowboat from a banana peel. <laughs> well, uh, uh, John Hancock is another one that sort of disappears, and he also had proposed himself to be commander in chief which I think would have made for a very short revolution if he had been in charge. Well, the, John, the, only, the only reason that we think that John Adams was interested in... in uh, Hancock. Uh, John Hancock was interested in Washington's job was because John Adams said so. Oh, okay, okay. There's, there's this long passage he has in his, in his uh, autobiography describing what John Hancock wanted. 
Well, John Hancock was actually the president of the Congress, and he, he had to work very closely with Washington. And I've been all through their correspondence and so on and so on. And they worked really well together through all the ups and downs of, of, of the revolution. And Hancock was the president for two and a half years. And, I, I can, and they went through some very rough times. And if Hancock wanted to, and made, Washington made a mistake, and if, one, if Hancock wanted to get him, he could have. He never huh. did. So all that stuff about uh, Hancock what comes from John Adams and, and, and uh, should be taken with a grain of salt. Hancock annoyed the Adamses because he was wealthy. He was rich. And he liked to flaunt it, uh, Hancock. And that irritated them, them no end. But they liked his money because, <laughs> because they needed it for the, for, for the revolution. So uh, they took, took the, his, his money like this, you know. <laughs> well, George touches on one of the, uh, the dirty little secrets of writing history, which is a lot of the things that we take as fact, when you look at the primary sources, you realize they're actually based on very little. Like, for instance, every history you read of George Washington will say that he wore his military uniform to Congress. But the only source for that that I know of is, again, John Adams, which is just one line in a letter to Abigail Adams, just sort of a toss-off about that. And, but you'll never read a biography of Washington that doesn't say that. So, um, uh, Okay, well, we've got a few more minutes here. Let that's, me, the only, that's the only suit he had. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> well, well, Washington was one of the richest, as you know, one of the richest guys. And of course, Adams was always very jealous of Washington, too. Uh, John Adams said the only reason that Washington got picked for everything was because he was the tallest guy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can, uh, can you talk any more about the book you're writing on, or do you not want to? What? Can you talk any more about the book you're working on now, or do you not want to oh, get into Oh, no, that? I don't want to talk about okay. that. I don't blame you. My agent would have my head. <laughs> uh, but uh, how are we doing on time? We've we got a, a couple, couple more minutes. Couple Let me just minutes? ask you one more question, and then uh, this okay. is kind of as much for my uh, <laughs> curiosity as anyone's. But uh, on a technical note, um, the research that you do, do you find that most of it you're able to do, I know you work at the Harvard Library a lot, do you find most of what you need is there? Uh, do you find the internet helpful in your research? Do you have to travel to archives? All, all of the above. Um, the, uh, the Harvard Library is unbelievable. Um, and um, it, it, the collection is, and, and it, can, it continues to get, uh, get better. Uh, yeah, the internet is grows all of Washington's papers are now on the, it's a, on the internet. So yeah, it's a great source. But uh, we, uh, my wife and I spent a lot of time uh, in England uh, and, and, and France and so on over the years. And I, you know, uh, we were in business, but I was, I was always uh, uh, doing research on what, what I was going to do eventually one day uh, at the British archives and, and uh, uh, the old British Museum, and and on and on, you know. So, yeah, and I've been at every major uh, research institution on the East Coast. I, one thing I uh, like to point out is that I've been at this damn thing for years and years and years. <laughs> you know, I didn't just sit down and write, um, and uh, it uh, it requires that. It's an enormous undertaking to write about, as you know, about the revolution. The amount of stuff written on it is, uh, is, a, is enormous, and a lot of it's good. All right, well, I guess that's uh, probably it for uh, our portion of the program. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah, specifically on Lexington. Um, can you give us your capsule take on why did that confrontation happen? Why did the British just pass through? Did they have a business that they wanted to do with any kind? I know the, the, the British column was led by a guy named Smith. Um, and uh, when I weighed uh, much more than I do, I always used to refer to him as fat. <laughs> British officer, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Smith. And he had orders from, from General Gage uh, not to engage the Americans. Uh, unless he absolutely had to. He was, he was to run out to Concord and uh, destroy the arms there 
his spies had given him details on, on everything that was, was there, and then he was to rush back to, to, uh, to Boston, and everybody lived happily ever after, and the king was going to be uh, happy, and, and so on and so on. Uh, the second in command was a Marine major named Pitcon. Pitcon had the same orders, but Pitcon answered to uh, the Admiralty. Uh, and so he could get orders from Gage, but the person he was trying to please the most would be the First Lord of the Admiralty, Admiral Sandwich. Admiral Sandwich, the man famous for the sandwich. <laughs> uh, Admiral Sandwich was a great gambler, uh, among other things, and, and he liked to go to the gaming houses uh, in London, and although he was enthusiastic, he was also a lousy gambler, and he would, he would lose his money, but he would sit there, and they would bring him his food, and that's a sandwich. And right next to him, oddly enough, would be defense contractors who would mysteriously pick up the losses. <laughs> That's why I really like uh, uh, Sandwich, very bright guy. <laughs> his, his wife was crazy, uh, insane, and his, his mistress was named, if you, you, can't, you can't make this stuff up, uh, Martha Ray was, was, the name of his, was the name of his mistress. And he used to go with his buddies on fishing trips without Martha Ray and without uh, without the uh, without the wife and no his buddies and so on no one knew where all those girls came from who <laughs> who also went fishing with them uh, they were great fishing enthusiasts <laughs> and, and uh, he would go for the weekend and and uh, they would have a really good time uh, and uh, so they would stay for the rest of the week so they could have another weekend and after the that weekend they would stay for another week and then another weekend, and then he would go back to the Admiralty. So here's, uh, uh, here's that's, the, that's the head of the Admiralty. When I first started looking at his Admiralty papers, this guy, what, what, what would you expect uh, from that? And, and I, don't, I was expecting, I don't know what. But the, the Admiralty papers, when he was on the job, were strictly business and very well written and very detailed. And one of the reasons the Royal Navy was as good as it was in those days was because of him. So when he was on duty, he was a different guy than when he was off duty. He also hated, hated Americans. He hated the whole thing over here. He thought they were cowards and they could be easily uh, 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 dealt with. He had a hand in burning He what? had a hand in burning in, in Portland? No, the, 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 that's another story. But we'll come back to it. If you want to add, if, if you want me to, that's, a, that's another session, really. <laughs> yeah, that's easy, a, easy. Love to do that. Actually, I'll be talking about that at the Tate House uh, at the end of July. So. Okay. I'm going to be giving a talk at the Tate House, I think, at the end of July about that. So, <laughs> so, so Pitcon is responsible to uh, uh, Sandwich. In what way? In this way, his, his future promotions uh, dependent on pleasing Sandwich. Sandwich hates the Americans, literally. And Sandwich and the king were like this, okay? So uh, the, king, the king wanted to kill as many rebels in the countryside as possible, okay? So Smith had orders not to, not to initiate any action. The second in command is Pitcott. So when they get halfway between Boston and, and uh, Lexington, Smith sends Pitcon ahead uh, with a couple of hundred uh, uh, troops because there's been a been delay. Uh, and so it's Pitcon in charge of the troops that get to Lexington, uh, Lexington Green. And so there's been all of this uh, controversy over the years about who started the killing on Lexington uh, Green. And I have a lot to say uh, about that. And I blame Pitcon. Uh, so, you've been to Lexington, and you remember the statue there? Well, the Green 
where the fighting uh, uh, occurred was much bigger than it is uh, what you see now. And Pitcon, uh, Pit, Pitcon uh, was, was, his second in command was another Marine named Jesse Adair. And Jesse Adair is the one who was in charge of, of the companies, small number, couple of hundred troops, who got to the, uh, the top of the green and went to the right down the Bedford Road, okay? Uh, Pitcon was a little bit delayed, and he went to the left down the Concord Road with about four or five other, other people, okay? And so Jesse Adair is, is the uh, officer who, in my uh, view, uh, initiated the attack on the Americans who numbered probably uh, between 75 and 80 who were there on the green. Uh, and the Americans were led by a guy named Parker, a veteran, uh, a decorated veteran from the French and Indian War, who told them to disperse when he saw how many uh, troops were lined up against him, and the British attacked them. Uh, why did Jesse Adair feel that he could attack him? Uh, it's because, it, only because Pitcon uh, wanted them attacked. Why did Pitcon want them attacked? Because he knew uh, uh, that the First Lord of the Admiralty and the King would have liked to kill every one of them on, on the green. As it was, they were 22% casualties uh, on, on the green. Now, when Pitcon gets back, he tells, he tells Gage that uh, he didn't initiate the fighting, that the Americans initiated the fighting, which the, the, the evidence, in my view, uh, does not support that. But one of the co interesting questions is Hancock and uh, uh, Sam Adams were on the scene at the time, so was Paul Revere. Uh, and Hancock was the head of the Provincial Congress there, and Hancock should have told Parker to get the hell away, get off the green. Why? Because all those 30 towns, those militias were being warned, were being alerted, and they were mobilizing, okay? And they were going to uh, outnumber by a huge amount this British column if given time. So get Parker and his people the hell out of the way, uh, 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 and I blame, I put a lot of the blame, and there's no other historian who does, I place a lot of the blame on John Hancock for not telling him this. Um, and uh, uh, Parker would have taken what he said seriously. Uh, later in the day, when the British were coming back from Concord, Parker's men who were, who were left there, the ones that were left there, uh, um, um, they gave the British back uh, everything that they that they had, uh, had suffered. So why was the bloodshed on Lexington Green? It's because of my friend Sandwich <laughs> and the King. That's why. And they would have loved more blood spilled because they thought this would be a warning. But of course it wasn't. It ignited all the anger all across the countryside. It did the exact opposite of what. I go on too long. Jim, you can have one more question. Okay. I guess. Um, just a question about money. Uh, money, yes, we'll be right by. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll be back there, happy to take we'll, it from we'll, you. We'll, we'll, we'll pass the basket. <laughs> uh, um, did the payments to the Crown, did Lexington and Concord, was that like an inflection point? Did people kind of stop paying the duties at that point, or did it continue on, or did it, you know, was... Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very good question. The, the, uh, America, the, 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 uh, the rebels in Massachusetts uh, at the, in the fall of 1774 created their own uh, uh, parallel government in, in Massachusetts. And the taxes then from the towns uh, who were supporting the revolt uh, paid their taxes to the Provincial Congress instead of to the usual place, which would have, which would have been the, the, uh, 
the Crown Treasury uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts. If that's what you're talking about, that's, that's how that, uh, that happened. And all the towns, every single one of them uh, uh, did that except for Marshfield. And uh, someone asked me about this the other day. What the hell happened in Marshfield? Uh, Marshfield uh, was, uh, was um, um, what's the name of the? I'm going to give a talk at a place called Winslow House in Marshfield uh, next month. <laughs> and, uh, there was a Colonel uh, Winslow who was a, was a great leader in Marshfield at the time. And the Marshfield militia, uh, he kept control of it. And it was a Tory militia. And so the town treasurer uh, had, to, had to send the money to, to the Crown in, in Boston, or, he, or uh, the Colonel would have had his head. And believe me, he would have. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, George.